Every yeah. single mm -hmm. asset class is going through a change. So we talked about office. People can work anywhere, anytime, any place, in any way that they want. Right. Um, and so then you look at the future of work. Whether so we're doing a ton of studies now, whether the work takes place onshore, offshore, near shore, right? Those are big topics. Mm -hmm. Downtown, suburban, or whether you use artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, or some kind of other um, vehicle. So we will go into a workforce, a population, use our tool to find out how does that play out with this specific job function and or workforce over the next five to ten years. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. I'm Damon Tamanawala. I'm joined by Garrett McGillivray. And with us today we have Sheila Bodding, who is president of Real Estate for Deloitte Canada. Thanks for joining us. It's kind of awkward to reach all the way across. <laughs> thanks but, so uh, much. Thanks for being here. Great joining both of you today. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, our, our, our pleasure. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, could you, like, can you tell us a little bit about how you got your start in the industry? Sure. So um, after grad school, I decided I wanted to become a management consultant and I joined one of the KPMG predecessor firms in Vancouver. And at that point, I learned how to be a, a good management consultant. Yeah. And I found that I was gravitating toward the real estate jobs, the real estate opportunities, whether that was for some massive development or seniors program. I led with that opportunity. So when I moved to Toronto, I decided to join a real estate company and applied to Royal LePage Commercial and right. started in their advisory group and spent over 20 years at Royal LePage, then Cushman and Wakefield. Right. Did you, um, did you, were you close with uh, Scott Chandler back then? Yes, of course, we were very closely together. CRE Library alumni, by the way. Let's actually, first let's talk, let's go right to the, because everybody knows so much about um, the Deloitte head office in Toronto. Um, so that was you. That was you were largely in charge of that whole operation. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about that process and you know what's the end result and you know sure. how did that work? Yeah, sure. So seven and a half years ago, Deloitte recruited me to come and work with them. And two years before I started, I got an email from the CFO. Hey, do you know anything about office space? Yeah. And given I'd spent my entire career looking at footprint optimization for various clients, you know, sure that was a slam dunk. And when we started on the Toronto strategy, suddenly then whack-a-mole happened across the country and that every lease was coming up, whether it was Langley, BC, or St. John, Newfoundland, Sherbrooke, yeah. Quebec, Regina, Winnipeg, the whole thing was rolling at the same time. And so that was really my introduction to the firm and to the firm culture. Um, in Toronto, as that opportunity became available, they had 11 locations, 510,000 square feet in the city. And I had my first tour of uh, Brookfield Place, our office space here, and it was essentially a cube farm. Right. And people were processing paper from the left to the right of their desks, and I thought, oh no, I, you know, it's gonna be really tricky to work in this environment. Yeah. CFO said, don't worry, you can recreate it. You can create the future for Deloitte. Oh. And so um, we did a, first of all, the consolidation strategy, which is what a year long of, of going through the financials and the approval process. And we identified that the 510,000 square feet could go to 420, um, accommodate the 3,500 uh, employees within that footprint, and right. then we started working with Brookfield to, in order to create a building together. So the Brookfield team, led by Jan Sicarda, together with, you know, my team, led that whole deal process to recreate the Bay Adelaide East Tower. Um, and so, of course, it starts with the transaction. What do you right. do in the transaction? So we would work through drafts. In the middle of that process, of course, we recognized very quickly that we needed an architect, that the base building architect would be great for the base, but for interiors and some of the things that we wanted to do would be really important. We ran a global RFP process. A, a number of architects came forward, including a really unique personality from the UK. And he came into our presentation, you know, just changed the way that I thought about real estate. And we started to then work together toward what this could become. That then created our podium and all the common spaces that we have. Earl Arnie is the name of this fellow. Okay, and yeah. He's wonderful with Arnie Fender Katsimalias, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, and so together we created this podium that essentially changed the, you know, you had a tower, another point tower, the podium out to Young Street. And for Brookfield, that allowed them to move the whole complex from Young to Bay Street and then Richmond to Adelaide. So it became a much more fulsome, integrated project. Yeah. 
um, so design was the first part, and so as we started moving across the country, we started pilots with the design. And I'd travel around the world at that point to look at different office spaces and had seen some of the Australian designs. You know, the incredible spaces for Commonwealth, really? Macquarie, National Australia Bank. And so as I looked at that, I said, I like that. We want to bring that to Canada. Yeah. And so we brought many of the ideas here. So that was kind of one design principle with respect to you know, phenomenal design. And the second part of that is how people work and the changing nature of work. Yeah. What, what were some of the, um, uh, we're going to dive back into that whole process, obviously, but what were some of the like crazier things that you saw as you were going around the world to, I imagine, like Singapore and Hong Kong and all these places trying to figure out the way to build out the space? Like, So the physical space design, yes, it's complex, and yes, you need great architects and engineers to be able to create that. That was... That you can do because there's, you know, Canada has an incredibly talented development community with Brookfield here in Toronto and Cadillac Fairview in uh, in Montreal, who also built a new building for us as part of the, uh, uh, the their new development there. Right. Um, and so as we were doing these projects, the physical design, yes, was tricky. Yes, you needed a very complex lease to be able to do that. Um, the second part of the most complexity was the changing nature of work. And so as I traveled around the globe, I found that many organizations decided to give up assigned seating for their people. Mm -hmm. So the, the business case behind that is that you're not sitting at your desk during the day. You're no longer processing paper from the left to the right of your desk. You're in fact moving, collaborating, meeting with clients. So you don't need a physical space 100% of the time. Right. You need it when you need it, you just don't need it all the day. And so the average office space is actually vacant 50% of the time. So when you can unlock that 50% vacancy and use that money or those resources to common amenities, your business case suddenly flips on its head, right? In terms of what it mm -hmm. can become. Yeah. So the change management piece, going to all of our senior partners and say, hey, you know that big <laughs> office space that you've had for years? Um, you don't really need that because you're not there, clearly. We actually did utilization studies and yeah. had people walking around the offices and said, you don't need the space. And if you don't need the space, you don't have that entitlement. So you can imagine the change management program that took place. We have an incredible CEO, Frank Batiste. And so Frank would say, I'll give up my office. No problem. So right, right from the CEO through to the newest recruit, we all have the same office space entitlements. Yeah. That has changed the culture of the firm. We've reduced our real estate costs substantially, yeah. like substan meaningfully, and, you know, over 20 years when we did the national program, and we accelerated our productivity by 20 to 30 percent. Wow! And so that flip was phenomenal. Now, when you go into Bay Adelaide or Montreal or Ottawa or wherever else we have these spaces. Um, suddenly you feel like you're engaged physically in the work environment, the architecture is phenomenal, the yeah. activity and buzz is phenomenal, and suddenly you're in a campus, you're not in a cube farm. And mm. that campus is what's created the difference for us. Have, have you found that people have started to accept the, you know, even those harder to move, like, I, for example, I know my buddy works at, uh, at uh, EY as a senior consultant, not even a big wig yet, but uh, if somebody comes and sits in his shared office space where he normally sits, he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? Really anecdotal, but... It's so, territorial. Yeah, exactly. So behavior modification is a big topic, right? As yeah. you can imagine, because you need a space to keep your stuff, whatever stuff you have, but you don't need a whole honkin' office or right. workstation for your stuff. And so when I go to the office, which is every day, I grab a space for when I need it, and then when I leave, I put it in the locker, and then when I go back, I pick up the same space, another space, whatever kind of space is available at that time. Right. And so the benefits of this are phenomenal. So the people that would give us a hard time ahead of this move, of which there were quite a few big personalities, right. afterwards were the same people who said, wow, this is amazing. Oh, nice. And so they would be the ones who would take people on tours, and I love this. So now 96% of our people would never go back to the dark ages in the way of traditional workplace. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, we're still um, dealing with our success because we've hired 2,000 people since moving into our space in Toronto. So now we need more space. Right. And, and so space always becomes a conversation. 
Um, but the agile ways of working are phenomenal because you're not locked in your cube farm and your entitlement. You bump into people, you know, all the time. Right. So you're able to have quick meetings, really quick, you know, yeah. spontaneous and, and do deals. So today as I was coming over here, I went down the escalator and one of my colleagues wasn't able to make a meeting yesterday. So literally we're passing each other on the escalator. Hey, one, two, three, about this meeting. Oh yeah, okay, I'm on it, blah, blah, blah. Versus <laughs> setting up a conversation yeah. and are you available and what time are you free? Scheduling so that time. can really yeah. accelerate your productivity. Yeah. Um, in your space, does everybody have the same level of entitlement to all of the space like in the sense that they can book out an office effectively like yes. a staff accountant could book yes. out the same office that you would be able to do yes is there any reserved spaces for you know so, upper management? so let's talk about i'll call it the day in the life of a deloitte employee regardless of their title or hierarchy because it is all the same yeah um uh, so if I have a meeting and I need a meeting room, somebody will have booked a meeting room for me. We've got a very expensive platform and system that does that. Mm -hmm. We tried to do that for individual spaces, but we found that people would game the system and they'd book it for two weeks and then not show up certain days. So we still had this 50% vacancy issue. Right. So for the personal spaces, it's a plunk and play kind of uh, mindset. So this morning I you know, was in the office early, you know, drop my coat and things there, then went and found a private office that I need for the day. So, you know, plunk myself in the pl private office where I'll be until I think three o'clock where I've got another big mm -hmm. meeting that I'm attending. And so for me that works. Other days I don't need that or I'll come and go to touchdown spaces depending. Right. And so different, we have over 100 business units, right? So different employees need different things. And so some of my team members may plunk themselves down for the day to do reports or whatever and they'll pick their favorite space to do that. Mm -hmm. We're all on, in our case, the 16th floor, which is the M&A assets and infrastructure floor. Yeah. Um, and so we have our home room, our neighborhood, everybody mm. knows where everybody else is and you feel like you belong. So what kind of, like, <laughs> you talked about this briefly before we were on camera, what kind of technology did you integrate into the space? That's a good question. Yeah. So everything. So the space has everything that you could possibly imagine. Deloitte is one of the most technologically advanced firms in the planet, so we had everything. So the first um, wave of technology was that everybody needed a laptop. Mm -hmm. We had some desktops, as you can imagine, the strategy started seven years ago, right? So right. It, it took a while. So, so everybody needs a laptop. Everybody also has a mobile phone issued by Deloitte. Mm -hmm. Because we have independence and security issues, we wanted to control the platform by which people use their mobile devices. And so as we work with our clients, we walk them through that technology change and what that could look like. We all get headsets, we're ready to go. So those two tools mean that I can work anywhere, anytime, any place, in any way that I want, which means I can also work 24 seven too. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can do all of those. So those are the two basic tools. So then behind that, you know, our, our, our um, chief information officer would, s our technology officer would say, you need to have incredible platforms to, be, to enable that. You need to make sure you've got the IT support. You deal with cybersecurity. And each of our right. different business units may have different platforms. So our audit folks may have one platform. Our tax folks may have another. And so it depends, again, on the business unit, how you access the technology that you need. Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenal platform. In the physical space as well, in the meeting rooms, you know, there'll be a smart board, so I'll jump into a meeting room, connect to the smart board, we're good to go. We have many of those everywhere, big, small, whatever, depending on where you are. Um, many collaboration spaces have that. And then about a year and a half ago, we started moving towards smart building technology. Originally in the design of the building, that of course hadn't been contemplated at that point, so now we're putting sensors all over the building. So I can go to the smart board at reception and see which floor is the busiest, when is the wow. next mm. uh, class at the wellness center, my D411, which is the genius bar, how busy is it, should I go there? And I can also access that information on my mobile device or on my laptop. Okay. So very cool in terms of what you can do with that. Yeah. Even that, you're probably still gaining information on how people are obviously using the space, which then you can then later optimize it. You know, if the 16th floor is completely jammed at all times, you might move a t half team out of there because then, you know, it frees yeah. up space because the 15th floor is empty. 
you know. Totally. And so the, the physical design principle is based on Lego, right? We have demountable wall systems that you can easily blow apart and change <laughs> if you need to. Yeah, and so since we've moved in, which was just two and a half, almost three years ago, we've changed some of the areas because we found that people wanted more agile project rooms as opposed to cube farm, you know, heads down space. Yeah. So we're constantly changing the space to meet the needs of the population. Okay. Wow. That's really cool. I'm <laughs> yeah, that's great. I haven't heard anything like that. So yeah, I'll gladly like take you on a tour anytime you like. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's basically like a completely modular office at that point. Yes. If you're able to just like deconstruct and then yes. reconstruct like on the fly like yeah. that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, one, uh, I kind of wanted to, ta uh, one thing I was, I was just really curious about. So you said you moved 10 different offices within Toronto into one building. like. Did you see any sort of knowledge, yeah, like, uh, I don't know what's the word, spread it, like spreading or like, was it, how did it change your company having everybody from the different departments? Yeah, did you develop any synergies, basically? There we go, so, thank you. So I would say it's all about synergies. So that yeah. you, and I'll, let me talk about the work we're doing with clients as well, because it's the same topic. Typically most organizations have an individual who's productive. Then that rolls into some P&L that's productive. Then it rolls into some division that's productive. Yeah. Then it rolls into some super division. Then some other super division. So you end up with many silos across whatever business unit that you're working in. And we as an accounting firm are really great at accounting for virtually every single hour that somebody works. Right. And so the reinforcement is by the silo, not by the overall totality. So now suddenly we remove walls, we remove barriers, we allow people to work together so that you end up working with people that you like to work with. We have 5,600 people in our Toronto space, there's 11,000 across the country, if you include contractors in that. And, and so with that platform, you can now do business in a very different way. And so suddenly, you know, from a real estate perspective, if you've seen our bistro at the corner of Young and Adelaide, yeah. that's deal central for the country. So I can go into our bistro and I can see different people and typically know what they're working on yeah. and be involved in some real estate aspect of whatever they're doing. Hmm. No outsiders in that uh, in yeah, the bistro, no. right? Well, yeah, guests, no. guests are allowed. Of course, okay, we can guests right, anytime. Right. Yeah, sometimes I look in through the glass and just fog up the window and wish I was there. What are you guys eating today? <laughs> so there's 127 <laughs> seats compared to our 5,600 population. It's a very small footprint. Yeah. On each floor we also have cafes so that people can access that on the cafes yeah. too. Right. Okay. So, so now we're pivoting to the world of big data, right? So blockchain is a process approach. Yeah. Now we're moving to big data, big platforms, mm -hmm. or small data, small platforms. Yeah. And you're now opening yourself up to cybersecurity issues. The whole U.S. political field is ripe with conversations around yeah. that whole discussion. And so paying attention to cybersecurity becomes absolutely everything. And so having a top-notch platform to be able to address that, really important. So same conversation, because I'm now at this great Bay Adelaide workplace, you know, three weeks ago I was sitting at my desk and I got an email from our folks who deal with the dark web and cybersecurity folks. So I get this email, mm -hmm. Sheila, one of your you know, one of our clients in the real estate market has been hacked and all their data is being sold out on the dark web. It's like, oh, this isn't good. <laughs> like, this isn't good. <laughs> because when that happens, then suddenly you've got an issue. So yeah. the good news is that our firm, like many firms, have folks constantly looking at that to see where the cyber issues are and you can solve it right away. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that mitigates that topic. So just like in our in our real estate world, we have people on transactions all the day. In the cyber world, there's people constantly combing and understanding that. I think there was a whole TV show, 24, done around that one, right? So mm -hmm. there's a, there's an opportunity to address cybersecurity. Sophisticated platforms, intelligent, knowledgeable approaches to this, which are beyond my personal expertise, but we have a bunch of people who do that, is becoming truly the wave of where the security world will move to. Mm -hmm. Right? The wars are no longer physical wars, they're now virtual wars. Yeah. So with the oncoming curve of you know autonomous cars, self-driving, all those types of things that are going to be hitting the industry in the next 5, 10, 15 years and making a really substantial change to basically how we move, basically, what are your thoughts on like how is that going to affect infrastructure? How is that going to affect parking? Like, our city is going to have to be redesigned at that point because of the efficiencies that will be garnered from stuff like autonomous vehicles. Mm. So let's start with 
the whole issues around the Industrial Revolution and how all kinds of technologies are, are completely changing how we live, work, shop, and play. So right. that's at the premise of everything that we're talking about. And so then you think about the accelerated technologies that are enabling autonomous cars. Suddenly you're now looking at a whole ecosystem that's different from the one that we know today. Um, and so we actually call that the future of mobility. So all over the Deloitte website there's videos, there's articles about the future of mobility. So now you think about the mobility ecosystem and how that's going to play out in the future. Um, and, and how, it goes back to change management again, how easily can people adopt the change? Mm -hmm. And so, um, if you're at the Real Estate Forum, you know, there's a fellow who talked about driving from Toronto to Miami in an autonomous car, and I think it took him, you know, 36 hours-ish to go there and 26 hours to come back. And that really kind of blows your mind with the art of the possible that is happening now on our streets. Um, it's just not out there for everybody at, at this point. So right. you know that within the next 10 years or so, autonomous cars will be very much part of what it is that we do. And maybe your next car is going to be an autonomous car as opposed to a self-driving car. And then, so just like today, we have private vehicles and shared vehicles, i.e. Uber and Lyft and all those mm -hmm. others. We may have private autonomous cars and shared autonomous cars. And so that whole ecosystem will change. Um, the adoption of that change will depend on regulation, public acceptance, change management, probably some elements of technology. Somebody once said to me, it's like today we all drive on the right side of the street, but tomorrow you're going to drive on the left and making sure everybody knows how to do that. Mm -hmm. So clearly that's going to take some time to work its way through um, our streets and our economy. In terms of the, the, I'll call it the real estate development equation, think about parking garages. They're yeah. just ripe for change. And so many parking garages that we go in today may have slanted floors and, and very difficult to repurpose slanted floors mm -hmm. in the future. So what developers are doing now is making flat slab floors that can easily be repurposed. You could create you know, storage for the omni-channel you know, retail that you may want to distribute into downtown, or maybe there's some kind of new whatever underground. But so, so managing the development of the future becomes a topic that architects are being, paying very close attention to. Um, then there goes back to the ecosystem, the mobility ecosystem, and all the different participants in the ecosystem and cybersecurity all over again, right? Mm -hmm. that, that plays out virtually in every single asset class or function that we consider. Yeah, anytime that you have technology, cybersecurity is, is a significant issue at that point. Are, are, are there any, uh, is there anything that you're seeing as kind of huge opportunities or even small uh, opportunities that could come from the self, like you mentioned, parking garages and maybe all the slanted ones will turn into movie theaters or something. I don't know, that's what you could put in it, right? But uh, like, is there anything, any other spaces, like I guess all the parking lots maybe will, I guess you still need a place to park the cars, but are there any early signs of uh, industries that could be disrupted by something like that? Or um, How long is a piece of string is the question. And so I think every industry will be disrupted. Okay. You know, every part of our real estate life cycle will be disrupted due to technology. So if you want, I can walk through our asset classes, and whether it's parking or some other, yeah. every single mm -hmm. asset class is going through a change. So we talked about office. People can work anywhere, anytime, any place, in any way that they want. Right. Um, and so then you look at the future of work. Whether so we're doing a ton of studies now, whether the work takes place onshore, offshore, near shore, right? Those are big topics. Mm -hmm. Downtown, suburban, or whether you use artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, or some kind of other um, vehicle. So we will go into a workforce, a population, use our tool to find out how does that play out with this specific job function and or workforce over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we're able to do that now. And then therefore you can line up your leases and uh, you know space requirements against that opportunity. So that whole world is changing. Right. Retail. You can shop anywhere, anytime, any place, anywhere. And so these omni-channel ecosystems of where you put your physical location versus your online location versus your supply chain becomes everything in that world. And suddenly things are moving around in boxes everywhere and it arrives at your house overnight. Who knew? Right? Like you wouldn't have thought about that five or ten years ago. And so the whole retail world is changing. 
and they're becoming, you know, the physical location for both office and retail is more about the experience. It's, it's focused toward the user experience and the kind of opportunity you can create for the individual. And you have different user profiles, of course, but it becomes about that. Um, institutional, so we're working with all kinds of um, public sector organizations looking at their special purpose space, whether it's science and labs or courthouses or training facilities, colleges and university. That's all changing because you can think about colleges or universities. You can do a lot of work online, and then your physical yeah, classroom experience becomes something different altogether. So literally every single asset class that we're speaking of, and then when you get into either advanced manufacturing or supply chain warehouse distribution, then robotics plays out in those examples. So literally everything that we know of is changing. Do, do you? <laughs> Do you find uh, a lot of your clients, uh, say Brookfield for instance, like are they like, oh my god, are people still going to be in our offices in 20 years or is it just, you know, pretty solid that everybody's going to need a place to work and like are there major shifts coming do you think or is it more? Uh, um, so not to speak to any one client or, or group that yeah. we, we work with, but yeah. let's just say the leading real estate service providers know that this is coming. We talk to, I talk to the world about these topics and, yeah. and there's a lot of content out there. Um, and so they know the world is changing, so they say, okay, how do we align our physical space with the virtual space? Yeah smart buildings, smart cities, right? So all of that starts to play out in what do you create in the physical space? And so for us, that physical space has taught a lot of people a lot of things. Um, and so what you've seen some folks do is buy into Convene or WeWork or some of these new spaces, you know, they're Regis. All of those firms are starting to gain momentum in terms of the service delivery around physical space. Yeah. So the role of physical space becomes different. You know, do I think people don't need it? No. I think there's all, people always need to get together. We need to get together and talk today, yeah. right? So there's always a role for people to get together. It's what does that look like in the future? Well, since you did touch on smart cities, um, how do you think that smart cities are going to be impacting real estate in the future, you know, with, with all that aggregation of more information that's going to be coming in, like big data is going to have a lot of influence on how, you know, things get designed, even at a basic sense, because people are going to be able to understand a, a heck of a lot more. Um, so the issue is really around data privacy and the right to use the data, right? And so I think that's a conversation much further beyond me and it's playing out in the mm -hmm. media these days in a huge way. But let's, let's think about your mobile phone. So on my mobile phone, people can track me wherever I am. Now mm -hmm. they're tracking a number, they're not tracking Sheila Botting per se. Yeah. And so if I go into a shopping mall, into a building, somebody's tracking me because the sensor's in the building and they're able to sort out where I am. And so the data privacy around that becomes a massive topic, as, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Um, I think that demographics play into that. People of my generation would typically not like that at all. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, people of my children's generation, you know, they would say, I'm used to this. This is okay. It's part of what I've grown up with and what I've learned. Mm -hmm. So I think you get a bit of both, and where that line fits will be certainly a, a, a conversation to get into for folks. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to lie. My brother's company basically just completely violates everybody's <laughs> privacy. <laughs> Yeah, um, his brother runs a company called, or is the CTO of a company, CTO uh, or CIO? Yeah, CTO of um, a company called Interspace, and what they do, it's basically Google Maps for the inside. Awesome. So they put up little cameras that are basically everywhere using LiDAR, and it tracks everybody and how they move within the space, is like 24-7. Waterloo? Waterloo? Yeah. Yeah. I think they came in not <laughs> too long ago. Are they in Communitech Waterloo? No. Okay, there's a whole group out of Community Tech Waterloo that came in and talked to me about that. Like, That's really cool. But as so, as an employee of that company, who's yeah. you've yeah. signed off that you're okay that your information or your behaviors are used yeah. in that space, and so the question becomes: Do employees want to allow that to happen, mm -hmm. or do they know that it's happening on my mobile device? They know where I am all the time, I, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of. I mean, like me personally, uh, you just kind of assume that it is happening. I'm like. You know, you, you think that Google, when you get an ad for something, you're like, oh, okay, well, this is, this is what they do. You kind of just get used to it. But um, 
But, oh, can we talk specifically about some, uh, some prop taxes? I know uh, Collier's has gotten really big into the uh, property technology space. Uh, and, and you guys are really big on it as well. Uh, are there certain technologies that, uh, that you're seeing that look really promising in um, property management and any sort of vertical or just overall? So let's just talk generally about the investment into prop tech. What was okay. the number in 2017? It was 12.6 billion compared to 4.4 billion the previous year. So yeah. everybody's into prop tech. In some way, shape or form, we're seeing an incredible um, avalanche of opportunities coming into this space. Um, for me, picking, you know, the new Google or Apple or it's Uber, tough, like, yeah. sorry, Netflix, like, I, you know, I Damn can't it. necessarily <laughs> do that. That <laughs> would not be, here. that would not be, you know, that's not my skill set. But are there applications around each of the asset class that we just spoke about? Absolutely. Yeah. Each of the, think about each of the streams that we're into in our real estate space, the physical world. How will that change? Prop tech is ripe for all of it. So we've, we've talked a lot about technology and how real estate is basically just, you know, it's going to be changing really hard, really fast. The string yeah. is, you know, so long, basically. How is that going to change the real estate professional of the future? Because, like, right now, everybody is, real estate is seen as a very archaic, old school yeah. system. Yeah. We're all finance professionals, and that's it, you know. But how is all this addition of technology going to, is it going to move us to be basically finance and engineers effectively or how are we, how mm. is that going to play out? So what you're really asking about is what is the future of work for the real estate industry? Yeah. So let's assume that blockchain will have a strong impact on our industry and it will accelerate our processes and make them easier so that we're not um, you know, doing whatever kind of analytics on Excel spreadsheet, but we've got some kind of a platform that accelerates that further. So we use the technology for a tool to get our work done. Mm -hmm. The estimates are that 20 to 30, 35 percent of jobs will go away in, in our real estate space as a result of that. Mm -hmm. The next big question will be what new jobs are created, right? right okay. Because in 10 years from now, mm -hmm. we're going to have a whole slew of new jobs. Right. So the job that I've done historically has changed dramatically, you know, doing research on office industrial retail markets to now using a tool and then talking and making decisions upon it really different. My daughter is a social media strategist. Those jobs didn't exist five or ten years right. ago, right? Just as an example. So I think the whole wave of new jobs will be very different. So just because we don't have people writing in ledgers mm -hmm. doesn't mean we don't need some record of accounting. The big question becomes disintermediation of brokerage. Right? That's really the big one that everybody's asking about. So let's, let's hit that one on the head. Yeah. Um, so if you think about brokerage, and, and I'll start on the residential side first of all. So on the residential brokerage side, there's a lot of people buying and selling things in the country. I mean, don't know the number of transactions every year, but it's a very crowded marketplace. If you've got 10 to 12 people attached to a transaction, as we mentioned, the buyer, the seller, the agents, the mortgage folks, the title people, and so on, that's a very crowded transactional space. Yeah. Um, so the question is, do we need real estate agents to do that? Well, if I have a transaction deal done on MLS, do I need a broker to help me to buy or sell? Absolutely. I would always use a trusted agent because they will know more about that market for the single largest investment or deal that I would want to do personally. I'd want somebody there. Right. And so all of our research is actually borne that out, that when people do their most important transaction, at least in the short to medium term, they'll want somebody there to help, you know, to walk them through the process, an expert through the process. It's, it's Will it be 100% mm -hmm. of the people that are there today? Probably not. Will there be 20, 30% less? Probably. So I think the people that do remain will have to be really smart on their game, be really great with other people, know how to do a decision, know how to, you know, maneuver the technology for the outcome for their clients. Mm -hmm. In the commercial space, that's even trickier. So think about, you know, the tenant rep business, for example. Yeah. You know, the typical tenant does a deal maybe once every 10 or 15 years, and they would know nothing about this whole topic that we've been discussing. So having somebody there to 
to walk them through that process, every day of the week you need that resource and that opportunity. You're okay. It's good. I feel secure. That's good. I'm glad <laughs> they feel you feel you better. Yeah, I feel, I feel good. Um, but um, you have to be really good at what you do, yeah, right? You yeah. have to be absolutely outstanding. So you have to take all the training and the development. It's no longer back of the envelope stuff, no longer back slapping, playing golf. Now you got to be on your game. Yeah, and it's a, it's a sophisticated profession, not a you happen to want to do it on the side on the weekend on the golf course. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think um, like in terms of techno technological disruption, it usually happens uh, at the bottom of the market first. So anybody who's doing like almost nothing, like they were just the friend that you knew, and you're like, okay, well, my friend's a broker, so he can tran he can work through this transaction, even though I know I want to buy that house. That person's probably gone, right? The person who's not adding too much value, but mm -hmm. as as you move up and you're more of an expert, I think uh, those people still definitely have a, a place. Um, one thing, because uh, I just want to be cognizant of how much how much time we have. Um, uh, and uh, you know you're the president of uh, Deloitte Real Estate, um, but but one thing that w you know in real estate we don't see a lot of diversity, whether it's uh, through ethnicity or um, male female, uh, and so I'm just kind of wondering, can you speak a little bit to that, and you know how to maybe like how can we change that? So I think it is changing. So, so why don't I share a little bit on my journey yeah. and, and the from to, cur you know, old state, current state. Um, so when I started over 25 years ago, there was a handful of women in the industry, right. not a lot. Right. And you tended to have very traditional roles in what you did. Um, I was able to spend one year in brokerage when I was very young. And now, years later, I would have been a great real estate broker. Yeah. I have no doubt about that, but because of the dynamics of the industry at that time, and I would suggest in the 20 years since, it's really tough for women in the brokerage world, very tough. Yeah. Um, you then say, okay, what do you do about that? So when I was faced with that over, I guess it was 25 years ago, um, we started a group called Toronto Crew. So the most senior women in the real estate business started Toronto Crew and said, we recognize this is an issue. How do we deal with it? How do we kind of raise awareness and a voice to that topic? So we started Toronto Crew, and it was part of the global crew network. Um, and so that was kind of a, a way of advocating. So now some of my best friends in our industry are the senior women from those original days. And yeah. they're all doing very well across our industry. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, if you read any of the work on diversity, and Deloitte does a, a ton on the future of Canada, the future of how diversity plays a really valuable role in our business. Um, you know, any business school will tell you that diverse teams are much more successful than homogeneous teams. I have a degree in science, and and so you know, you learn about a monoculture not surviving, mm -hmm. and yet a, a you know a, a diverse culture is in fact much better. So today I run one of the most diverse teams, I think, in the country. Yeah. And bringing together all those different personalities, whether it's gender or culture or technical diversity is also really important. Mm -hmm. um, then you get a, a far better outcome, in our case, for our clients or for the projects or whatever that we work on. So in fact, there's a huge business case for diversity mm -hmm. and how you apply it and how you drive it forward. Yeah. Um, so and so I think it's an imperative for our diversity. industry. So I, I think in our industry, we're so linear in our thought, tends to be so um, traditional in our perspectives that it's hard to then open up to the broader conversation. I think now the imperative's there. In order to be resilient, you, you need that diversity in order to build resilience within companies. Mm -hmm. And then I, I guess like I have the example of brokerage. How do you foster that? And how do you, like, uh, obviously we do have some uh, women in our company, uh, callers specifically, who just absolutely destroy, like, are killing it. Um, but how do you, like, the ones who are good, how do you make sure to, I guess, keep them and promote what they're doing? And, um, like, how do, how, do we, how do we continue to grow? Is it just something that happens, or? So, so let's talk about the industry. I'll start there. So in the industry overall, again, we recognize the same issues. So RealPAC has actually started a diversity and inclusion committee mm -hmm. chaired by Blake Hutchison. And so within that committee, there's been certain um, 
uh, you know, positions taken with respect to the industry. And so one of the small things that we said would be a great idea is if you're ever on any kind of a real estate panel, you always make sure that somebody else on the panel brings a diverse, diverse background, whether it's gender or ethnicity or whatever. And so that took place. So the recent Toronto Real Estate Forum, you would probably see a greater evidence of diversity. Mm -hmm. So then therefore, the young women who are there or the young, uh, you know, culturally diverse people are able to say, wow, there's somebody like me on that yeah. panel. I can Role aspire models. to that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that would be kind of one place. And that plays out also within companies, that that, that diversity across the board is very important for role modeling, um, for integrating into teams at both the executive and leadership level right throughout the entire organization. And then the other part of that is, yes, there's mentors and coaches, but there's also advocates for people. Yeah. And so, you know, if there's five people going for a job and, you know, the traditional personality has been advocated for, I guess the right way to word that, um, then, then that's uh, you know, almost a slam dunk compared to, say, a diverse candidate. So I think you just have to be mindful when making the decision that you're bringing the best candidate forward for that role, yeah. and then you've got a diverse team at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the best candidate may very well be a, a white male. That may yeah. be the right answer. Yeah. And so it's about having the blend that I think is the, is the final outcome, not necessarily one, uh, you know, monoculture. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, in a lot of cases, probably a lot of managers don't understand the value of diversity. So they just think that, you know, the traditional white male or just male in general might be like, this is how it's it's always been, effectively, you know? Yeah. These are all the other people that we've hired, so it's like, let's just keep doing the exact same thing. So they don't even know at that point that, you know, if you include people of other technical backgrounds, because like... We yeah. Me personally, I'm the one that has the weird technical background, basically. So I'm sort of the oddball whenever I get placed at a company, basically, versus the diversity angle. Mm. But yeah. people just don't know. I, yeah. I think it's. I, I think it's like I remember hearing one of my uh, fellow employees, who's a, who's a woman, she's great, but she said, "Oh, she doesn't experience diversity at all." And I was like, "What? How? You're not in our group chat, for instance. Like, there's some. We'll edit this out, but there's some opportunities that you're just." wouldn't know about just because of like guys being guys like we're on the hockey team together right it's like hot you know and it's and it's tougher so um anyways i, I don't know where i was going with that but a lot but, of, a lot of so respect for but that's the issue right because if there's you know we, so we toronto crew we started a golf tournament so 25 years ago we started this golf tournament and none of the women including me knew how to golf right yeah. and so you said hey let's learn how to golf and so you try to join them so to speak mm -hmm. and maybe unsuccessfully on my part because i'm still not a good golfer uh, um but um you you try to look for opportunities that are inclusive as opposed to just you still should play hockey you know there's no reason why people can't play hockey yeah. it's just you know how do you also have moments Moments that are inclusive yeah. for everybody. Yeah. So that's what great leaders do, right? They make sure that you've got moments for both, for, you know, all different groups in one setting. True. Yeah. Yeah. You know, inviting somebody who's a vegetarian to a steakhouse may be a problem. That's really right. what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's really what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. Well, just well, it's fine. There's, <laughs> they've got salad there. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask one of my favorite questions. What company <laughs> is your favorite disruptor? Do you have one? Like, what company do you see that's the most promise, or even maybe something that's the type of technology? So within our Deloitte office space, we actually have an innovation zone that we call the greenhouse. And the greenhouse showcases 20, 30, 40 different technologies produced by Canadian companies, typically at a Communitech and or Singularity University. Awesome. And we showcase those technologies to be embedded in, a, you know, in one of our clients' businesses. And so, you know, it could include wearables that you're going to wear in a mine. It could be some gadget you're going to put in a fire hydrant that will change that. We have Pepper the Robot, artificial intelligence. But the one that's really striking to me is actually I think it's Doc in a Box or some version of that. Doctor in a Box, um, developed out of Communitech in Waterloo, and it allows. I think it's, it, it won one of the big competitions that Deloitte is involved with. For under two hundred dollars, you can assess somebody's physical health 
from you know blood tests through to heart rates and others and that goes into this platform and you put this thing in your ears at the same time and it goes into the platform and it can diagnose 80 to 90 percent of somebody's health and well-being so oh. you can imagine taking that to developing countries or remote locations mm -hmm. and then feed that into a system it's, it's a remarkable yeah. kind of invention on what that can do for the world let alone all different aspects. So those technologies really appeal to me because it, it changes the world as opposed to some new widget that, you know, yeah. is a better way to fry your pancakes or something, <laughs> right? right? Um, so this is, this question is called the three truths. So um, years, so we ask, we ask all of our guests, you'll be able to answer, don't worry. Um, years from now, um, you live till 150 years old and you have a wonderful life and publish a bunch of books and accomplish everything you always wanted to accomplish. Um, and your whole family and friends are around you, but it's your, it's your last day. And uh, for whatever reason, everything that you've created um, from your books and your videos uh, have all been erased and you only have uh, three short lessons to, to give out or write on a piece of paper pass on to your kids and, and friends and family uh, about how to how to live life uh, so uh, what would those what would those lessons be um, three things that I'd want my children and or my family to know about in terms of how you how you navigate your life I think the first one would be make sure you understand where you want to be in the future plan your five or ten years out make sure you're very purposeful on making your own choices and don't be a cork on the ocean letting other people make choices for you right. so I think that's probably the most important thing that you could say to anybody it's so easy to get wrapped up in things and to be you know one of the gang so to speak and be part of that versus being very purposeful for your own goal your own destiny based on your own strengths, right? Mm. Everybody has their own individual strengths, and so I think play to your strengths towards your, towards your goal and your purpose. Yeah. The second thing would be to be bold and take challenges. You know, we as Canadians tend to be very conservative. You know, prove it to me a thousand times before I'll go out and do one, two, three. Yeah. Um, and so I think taking bold but calculated steps based on where you want to be is really important. I think we all have the coulda, shoulda, wouldas. And so taking those bold steps would be an opportunity for you. And the last one is about your community, right? And, and being with, um, within your community, that's people, colleagues, family, um, you know, friends, um, and, and, and being a committed member of your community with integrity and trust. Mm -hmm. It's so often that you can uh, become anonymous within a community or you can do things that maybe your mother wouldn't want you to do. Um, but I think behaving in a, in a manner with honesty and trust is really important. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Gives us a lot to think Thank about. You. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.